You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brook. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brook, your host, where my mission is to have guests at, that relate and recall moments of their life that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. My favorite word, gratitude. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget, how you can become a gratitude believer, and maybe one or two takeaways from today's show. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk radio network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, or any other places that you get your uh, podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I really appreciate that. And then also, uh, people ask me a lot about gratitude journals. So to purchase a gratitude journal or to find out more about my gratitude speaking, one-on-one coaching, group coaching, and so on, you can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And as you can see in the background, you can also connect with me at thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. So let me get on to the show. Always my favorite part of the show is the guests. Today, my guest is Chrissy Hoover. Let me tell you a little bit about Chrissy. There she is waving. Uh, Her interests include fitness and nutrition. She strongly believes that leading an active and healthy lifestyle makes a big difference. She's interested in sustainability, environmental ethics, charities that benefit animals, and also likes to spend her time learning social media marketing and how it's having a fascinating effect on the new wave of business development. She's a marketing director for multiple startups with the main goal of scaling and increasing profits, and she's just a bundle of energy and drive and motivation. Chrissy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. You bet. You bet. So I always start out with the context to tell people because we meet people in so many different interesting ways. Tell the listeners how you and I met. Actually, I met you because um, I was in the Rotary and um, we kind of talked about, you know, different speakers and such. And you came in and did a presentation and I was absolutely blown away because it's really rare that you find somebody that just has the it factor. Um, and you definitely did. And I think it's really awesome to see somebody that not only just kind of preaches and says these things, but lives their life based off of these concepts. It's really powerful to see. And uh, just the things that you had said, I remember me and one of my buddies were in it and we were taking notes and doing the things that you said and talking about, you know, write down things that a friend would say about you and Mm -hmm. write down these positive things. And he turns to me, he goes, I don't know about you, but my mood is elevated after this and I said yeah it was like a magical experience and so um after that I had you come in and do a presentation at my previous employer at a mortgage company and everybody else had said the same thing and I'm like there's a method to this and I you've really dialed it in and it's powerful to see and I'm so grateful to be a part of it Oh, thank you, Chrissy. And I remember that uh, exercise way back at the Rotary because I do usually one or two Rotaries a week and I do get a lot of speaking gigs and uh, different referrals from there. But that particular exercise is called the UR exercise and it's how somebody else sees you. And if we're on Zoom, as we have been through the pandemic, I have person, I have a people protect or pretend rather that for about 60 seconds, they're their biggest cheerleader. And I have them write down yeah. how they describe that person as you are what they are. And it's amazing why the reason I like that exercise so much, it makes you feel better, number one, and we're all looking for ways to be healthy and mentally strong in in a healthy way and not an unhealthy way like some of the the things that happen out there in our world. But I think it's really interesting why we seem to be so hard on ourselves. And somebody always sees us in a better light than we see ourselves. And so uh, I look at somebody like you who's so motivated and right off the bat, I would ask you, where does that motivation come from? And in the handful of times that we've talked, so one, two, three, four, five, probably half a dozen times, I always come away from going, man, she's got a bright future. And for just a young, young little <laughs> whippersnapper on the way up, Thank you know, you. <laughs> if you will, where, where do you think that motivation came from you? I think the motivation has just been there as part of like who I am. Um, I've never been one of those people that 
just wants to do average. I've always been, okay, so we did this, what's next? We did this, what's next? And it's not just necessarily for myself, but it's also about for the other people that you can have an impact on. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're doing well, you can impact more people's lives. And so for me, the motivation has just been like, you know, hit your personal best and then compete with that every single day. I do that same thing in the gym. Um, I would reflect that in my whole life. Um, hit your personal best. I mean, even with my hobbies, I've done that with like cooking and stuff, hit your personal best, do the hardest recipe, and then compete with that on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's really an easy way to get better and better ourselves like slowly because it's you against you every day, bit by bit, better and better. And, you know, part of that motivation is also just from having a great family and wanting to see them do well and be a positive influence in people that I care about, you know, in that sphere. So, mm -hmm. and I think it's interesting, um, compete with your personal best. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about, and again, back to that, you are exercise. Why does somebody see us in a better light than we see ourselves? It's interesting to me that, uh, some people constantly compare themselves to other people. And I tell people that's kind of a, um, a fruitless exercise. It's like a cat chasing its tail. And I think somebody once said recently, I picked it up. I really love, they said the only thing, only person you should compare yourself or compete with is who you were yesterday. And I yes. think that's, that's really cool. So when you, you mentioned the gym and working out, which is so important, the physical piece, when you get to be my age, I've read a lot of books about longevity and taking care of yourself. And the number one thing, regardless, I mean, they, they you know, don't drink or smoke or do drugs. Some of the natural things try to keep your weight in check, but the ones also at the top of the list is exercise. So how do you find that you get motivated consistently to get to that gym and work out and take good care of yourself? So I actually don't get motivated to go to the gym. So, um, when I first started weightlifting was about eight, nine years ago. Hmm. Um, I used to be kind of like a party person and real socializing and stuff like that. And what I had realized is that I was kind of suffering with anxiety and that I was using drinking and going out to kind of cover that up. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that. And so kind of when I came to that realization, I was like, I want to find a healthier way to cope with this and a healthier way to break through this. And so, um, I had always been a physical person and done all kinds of sports and stuff like throughout, you know, high school and all of that. But, um, a couple of my friends had recommended to me weightlifting. And when I dove in on that, I just felt, felt the sense of peace. Um, so there's something about like, you know, pushing your body brutally and lifting the heaviest things that just, it, it wears you out, but it's almost this weird sense of peace at the same time. And so, I don't actually get motivated to go to the gym. When I had initially started, it was really fun. And it was like, wow, I'm so motivated to do this. I'm seeing so many changes, but that's not how longevity works. Longevity is based off of your habits. So I, when I commit to going to the gym, I'm making a promise to myself and motivation is fleeting. You might have a day where you're level 10 out of 10 being motivated and then another day where you're only six out of 10. And if you base your habits off of your motivation, then that six out of day, ten, six out of 10 day, you may skip the gym. Mm. But if it's based off of your habits and your personal promises to yourself, then it's something that you know is going to be around for the long haul because you're not basing it off of motivation. It's kind of the same thing as moods. You know, you wake up in a bad mood, you wake up in a great mood. Those things are always going to fluctuate. But if you base things in your life off of healthy habits, then it's something that you know you can always count on. Just right. kind of like writing in your journals. It's a habit. Yeah. You do it daily. It's healthy. You mentioned that earlier, relying on habits, uh, really in kind of in place of motivation, and that takes care of it. W what's kind of your belief? I hear a lot of different numbers on this about how long it takes to develop a habit. I've heard, you know, snap your fingers, and I've heard six months, and I've heard three months. And what have you noticed as you've used that kind of as the way to keep you focused? How long does it take you to kind of develop a new habit? So uh, they used to say it was like 21 days is I think what the main um, word on the street was, but basically um, I'm reading a book by a new neuroscientist, Carolyn Leaf, mm -hmm. and she was saying that they've pretty much found out that scientifically it takes about 60 days for you to build a new habit. And that's just within you know, the neural pathways in your brain and all of the things that go on on a subconscious level it takes about 60 days for you to build a habit, you know, prior prior beliefs were shorter days, but they said scientifically they've gotten it down to about 60. And I could see that being reflected, especially because 
sometimes you start something and you think it's great and then you fall off from it. But if you can stay the course for those 60 days, it's probably going to be something that's instilled. And that's the same thing I would say is rewiring your brain. Like I was saying, I had dealt with a lot of anxiety and stuff. And I try to make sure to practice gratitude every day, even if it's not just writing in a journal, it's something like the what if game I play with myself uh, while I'm driving, because you're going to be driving every day. Let's be real. I mean, not maybe during quarantine, but during regular life and back to the regular life we're getting to you're driving every day. So I play the what if game where instead of having, you know, negative thoughts or whatever you could just the best scenario ever, like, what if I have the best day ever? What if I meet totally awesome new people? What if I crush all my sales goals? You know, what if, you know, I do something really nice for someone else and you just keep going until you feel like, elevated because you're focusing on these positive thoughts and, and carving out like what a positive future could look like instead of all the, what if this goes wrong, worry and negativity that people get caught up in. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I love your approach to so many of these different things. And as I said, just it's, I, I don't want to, be, I remember my parents always criticizing our generation. I think every generation kind of criticizes the next ones. And, and when yeah. I was growing up and you guys are your long hair and your beetle boots and all this kind of, cause the beetles were in popularity and so forth. And so I think every generation looks at one and kind of thinks, are they going to be able to keep up with us? But I think it's so important and is to recognize things. Half the battle is to recognize something, to acknowledge it. And then the better, the other half is to do something about it. So when you talk about the anxiety, was that something that when you, you decided I was out partying or drinking or whatever it was. And then I was having anxiety and I think I'm going to go to the gym. I think I'm going to weight lift and things like that. Did that happen like overnight? It was it over the course of time or did you kind no. of just, how, how did that turn about come around? That was probably about like a two year process because oh, okay. I had, I didn't really know like what anxiety is um, and like how it manifests. And so I just thought, you know, drinking and stuff was fun, but I didn't really realize that I was using it to cope. Um, And so it was initially when I just wanted to be healthier and go to the gym and stuff. That's where I noticed that real sense of peace. And that's when I was like, okay, I don't see the need for partying and stuff as much because it's just, you're getting that sense of peace from somewhere else. And it's a healthy base instead. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other thing that I'm kind of learning now is like with labels for like anxiety, depression, you know, ADHD, all of these things, part of that, um, like coming from the neuroscientist perspective is not like a disorder or there's something wrong with your brain. It's more along the lines of, you know, you have trauma that you have to work through or deal with and it's manifesting as anxiety or depression or, you know, whatever else. And to look at it more like we're all in this human condition together. And this is a regular part of the human condition and being able to just work through it has been something that's been helpful for me is to reframe it instead Mm -hmm. of you have this disorder. It is, this is the human condition and this isn't something that you're stuck with or tied to. It's something that can be worked on, managed and handled. And I think that's a great point because words have such power. And I know that being someone who suffered with depression at different parts of my life and have tried to manage it, the word that you always hear is stigma. There's such a stigma with them. Yes. Like, what? You're depressed? You could be, you're so energetic. You're so high, man, high energy, da, 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 da. And, and it's just, then oh, I'm not going to talk to me about it because they're going to judge me then. And so our words that we choose and to really sort of reframe it, I just put here ADHD, depression, anxiety, trauma, things like that. And also, I, I also want to just quickly throw in this so I don't forget to give you a compliment because I said to myself, well, the podcast starts at X time, you know, and so sure enough, here's Christy right on time, just like when she called me before she follows up, I sent her some stuff. She sends me the picture, the bio, all these things back and forth. So in kind, I will tell you when you said Dr. Carolyn Leaf, I said to myself, wait a second, a 90 minute YouTube video. Now I know Chrissy relatively well, but that's a gigantic (laughs) commitment, an hour and a half. I mean, if it's 20 minutes, I can do it. And I think, yeah, but gosh, she's so on top of it. I can't drop the ball. So I watched the whole 90 minutes of Dr. Carolyn Leaf. And um, I just thought it was fantastic. And one of the biggest takeaways, speaking of our, our brain and how we try to, we forget about exercising our brain and cutting our brain some slack, but she says, you can go three weeks without food. You can go three days without water. You can go three minutes without oxygen, but you can only go three seconds without a thought going through your brain. 
Yes. And I thought, are you kidding me? Our poor brains, it's 50,000 thoughts a day. And, and there's things like gratitude journals, there's meditation, there's working out the weights, as you mentioned at the gym, things like this to mm -hmm. just give your brain a break. And I used to say, if you could, if you could interview with your microphone, a certain organs, it's like somebody who's got, you know, a smoker and I'd love to interview their lungs, have the lungs go, we are sucking down here. This is terrible. We're trying to get you oxygen. You're putting smoke in here, but imagine right. Right. interview somebody's brain i never get a break this guy goes 100 miles an hour like the gas pedal on the floor so <laughs> yes that's, that's why i like <laughs> that that's why i like the weightlifting is another thing so uh if you don't if you don't mind and it's it's okay if you just say well, let's kind of move on but you recently have dealt with quite a, a tragedy in your life and so how has christy hoover's attitude with some of these things that you've learned really kind of helped you to kind of cope going through what you've just gone through yeah, well, just a few weeks ago, I did lose my mom to cancer, um, which we talked about. Um, and the way that I kind of think of it is a little bit of like, you know, what we've talked about and stuff, but I think it really does go along with like the mind management of, you know, doing physical things and then doing also mental exercises. And um, like I've said is sometimes I have a day where I'm still happy 10 out of 10 and I feel okay. And then I also have down days where I feel six out of 10 or something. And the best way to kind of try to reroute and help change that mood and stuff is, you know, to do something physical, like go to the gym and exercise or, you know, write a letter about what I'm thankful about and just list everything off. That's great in my life to remember that, you know, even though this terrible, horrible thing happened, not everything is all bad. Don't look at things as absolutes. It's not all black and white. Um, and the other thing that I have actually practiced is write a letter to yourself as if you were like your best friend writing a letter to you, like, um, to try to help you get through something. So mm -hmm. like, for example, like in, in my case, like my mom passing away, like write a letter as if it's your best friend writing you like a heartfelt, like condolence letter on like, I'm here for you. It'll be okay. Da, da, da. Like a one page letter of like somebody helping you get through it and read it back to yourself. It's so important. I know that they're one of the things, and I'm, I'm sure I did a couple of them when I did the presentation for Minuteman, is I'm always trying to think of different ways to have exercises. We talked about the UR one that the other gentleman mentioned to you as well. Uh, there's another one I came up with recently. I don't know if we did it for Minuteman or not, but it's similar because I'm making some note. Mind management tips, I'm calling them from Chrissy Hoover, is going to be our takeaway, I think, for today, among other things too, but is this idea of the most memorable events of your life. So what I have people yes. do is, and so I think, do we do that? Do we do that back to you, yes. remember? Because I tell for the, the benefit of the listeners on the podcast, I have people, I give them 60 seconds and I say, I want you to write down the most memorable events of your life. And so you think, wow, I mean, the most memorable. And I always tell them it could be personal, professional, uh, kids, uh, family, spouses, uh, trips, you know, all sorts of things that are really most memorable. So I give them 60 seconds. So obviously you're not going to be able to write down everything, but I tell them now what I'd like to do is the homework is a week from today. I want you to increase that list, either a top 25, top 50 or top 100, and then put it on an Excel spreadsheet or a Word doc or wherever you can kind of organize it and make sure you prioritize it. You know, my yep. number one was the birth of my younger son. And number two is the adoption of my older son. And then I go mm -hmm. down speaking to 10,000 soldiers and national champion, mm -hmm. hydroplane driver, blah, blah, blah. And it really, really helps just like these two letters that you're suggesting too, because you go down and you look at all, oh my gosh, I've done so many things and you're focusing on your blessings and your abundance and you're not concerned about your lack. And the reason mm -hmm. I even started that is because one day I thought I've never been to France. I've never been to Italy and I started going down the wrong road. So uh, even, and somebody told me something, and this is pertinent relative to your mom, is somebody said the other day, and I wrote it down. I really liked it. I said, it's still possible to be grateful when you're going through grief. And there's still other things that they're there. It's hard. It's, it's a very, very difficult thing. We're all born and we all pass away. But there are times where you can still see through the darkness and see some of the things you're grateful for. And I saw another quote too that reminded me of what you just said. And it was talking about how um, grief is like the darkness on the canvas that gives the painting depth. Mm. And so it's what gives our life depth because like without, you know, the sad things to measure it to like, how do you know that you've experienced real happiness? Right. 
That's true. It's almost like you can't appreciate up until you've seen down type of thing. And another thing, uh, touch on this, Christy, is uh, Christy is in the time that I've known you, you've switched jobs and things. And I just, I'm so not, I won't say appreciate, but just so impressed with people in your generation. You're a couple of generations behind me or ahead of me or whatever it is behind me, I guess. And this concept of not getting in one place for 50 years and getting a gold yep. watch and we just don't leave. So talk about, a little bit about your journey to where you are to these multiple startups today. Yeah. So I'm okay. Well, I guess I got to backtrack a little bit. So my parents were entrepreneurs growing up. Um, they always ran their own business. And so I kind of grew up with that and didn't grow up with people that had the nine to five in my house. And so that did definitely definitely shape like how I look at business and productivity and all of that. I don't have the typical outlook of, you know, hang your hat here and then till you retire. Um, and I would say that that's really pushed me to be better because I always wanted to be able to, you know, be having that freedom and flexibility and, and make something worthwhile. And so, I mean, I went and got my marketing degree at Portland state and I've always been interested in sociology and all that as well. Took a bunch of classes on that. And then, um, you know, I was in the medical field for a little bit before I found like my home and mortgage. Um, when I was doing that at my last company, I kind of built a startup essentially from scratch. Um, you know, I helped the boss like triple his team profit, you know, set up whole systems and stuff in place. And it was so challenging that I was like, this is really, really fun. And now, um, with what I've moved on to now, it's three different startups, um, mortgage, real estate, and also credit repair within the next year to two years, we're going to have a company as well for actual home building. Mm -hmm. So it's like all these different arms that kind of feed different things, but coming in from like the ground up and running these from scratch with my business partner has been amazing. It's like one of those once in a lifetime experiences where you learn so much and it's crammed into just a quick amount of time. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I just, I'm so thankful and the experience has been so rewarding and I'm the kind of person that I'm like, it's only up from here. So yeah. that's always been my mentality. It's only up from here. Um, I know what I'm worth and that worth just keeps increasing as, you know, I gain more knowledge and more insight into life. And that's just kind of the way I see it. I call it like an abundance mindset. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great term. And you said uh, mortgage credit repair. What was the third one? Mortgage credit repair, real estate, and then also um, a development development and, for and actually making gonna be coming too. Oh, that's really fantastic. And, yeah. and I, again, I just think it's, it's interesting when I ask about motivation and you said, uh, rely on your habits, which I really liked. And that's, I think that's really a powerful statement you said right at the outset. Uh, but I also well, think I, I see motivation as, as emotional. Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's emotion based, not logic based. And when mm -hmm. you feel really motivated to do something, you're relying on your emotions and yeah. Absolutely. habits are something that's logical and we've scientifically proven that emotions are something that just pass through you. They're yeah. fleeting. So to be able to rely on that logical side, I think is what will get you through the finish line. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think again, breaking it down, you talk about habits, breaking it down into action steps and a to-do list and things like this. So it, it becomes more, there's certain people that they, they just, I've had friends, they just want to whine. And I always say, let's get a piece of paper and let's get some steps down here. Things we can do. Don't just sit there and complain. We've got some action. And when you write care. your goals, you are yeah, way more like. Oh, exactly. Exactly. So, so them. very true. But I ask people a lot about the motivation piece, the inspiration, maybe was it the parents? Was it the professor? Was it a teacher? Was it a, a cohort or co-worker, whatever? But with having entrepreneurial parents, uh, that sounds like that set a good trend for you from the beginning, didn't it? Yeah. And what was the biggest so thing? So actually, I wanted to them? ask you a question while we're on here. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the question I wanted to ask you is what about gratitude for manifesting? Because I've kind of done that in some small ways. Like you send a text message to yourself, um, like, you know, expressing how thankful and happy and how blessed you are to have accomplished X, Y, Z goal. Right. It's as if you've already done it. Um, and then the other thing that I've done every year for like the past four years is I write out, um, it's, it's like my yearly goal list, whatever it is, but it's like, I'm so thankful that I bought a new house and I'm so thankful that I have like the best relationship and I'm so thankful. And it's like all of my goals 
for that next coming year, but I'm writing them out how thankful, how blessed how abundant my life is as if I've already accomplished them. And ever since I've done that in the last four years, I have hit like 95% of everything on there. It's very, it's very powerful. And and what you're describing in the gratitude journal that I sell, uh, that I use that gratitude guys, daily gratitude journal, there's the things you're grateful for on the left-hand side. And it has Mm -hmm. a little place for your current events and special occasions. So you don't have to have a diary. Then there's the highlight of your day. uh, What was the best thing? I always write first thing in the morning. So was the best thing that happened to me yesterday. And then on the right side is your gratitude intentions, AKA your gratitude for tomorrow, where you're writing to be grateful about things that haven't even happened yet as if they've already happened. And I always use the example. I may have said it when I spoke to you, uh, your your groups before, but is I always write, I'd say something like, I'm grateful. I'm speaking to hundreds of people. And then there'd be a hundred people. Then it was a thousand people and then a thousand. Then I'm grateful to 10. Then I spoke to 10,000 people. And then I thought, well, I'm, and took it up to a hundred thousand. And then I had my videos get bigger. And then I finally said a million. And I had one Mm -hmm. video that had a million views. And I just went, wow. So it's just planting that seed because your subconscious mind cannot distinguish between what it thinks happened and what actually has happened. And so yes. you can program it. So it's it's really, really cool. And it's so important, which is why I think we all, there's something else I do called the association evaluator, which I think is really important where real quick exercise that people write down one or two people that you should probably limit your associations with. They're just not real healthy for you. And it's just, you know, don't, don't have to blow them out of your life, but one or two people, you just, when you leave them, you don't feel as good, you know, and, and you can always tell there's certain people we get around and we leave them to kind of check your temperature, if you will, after they leave, do you feel better or worse? Yep. And so there's those people. So maybe limit, then there's the expand your associations, one or two people you want to spend more time with because you always feel good and you always get a lot out of them. And there's that and kind of take this inventory of your friends. And then the third thing is one or two people you want to mentor or have mentor you, because there's nothing quite like being mentored and mentoring people. When people Mm -hmm. tell me, I get you've changed my life and you've impacted my life. And I'll never forget when you said this, you're the first person to say that and things like that. It's really, really powerful. So knowing how you impact people in life and the people that impact you, Uh, really makes a big difference to your kind of your overall experience. Oh, I think Chrissy froze for a second. I'll wait till she gets back. Well, let me mention too, as I'm thinking about it, I think she froze on her, on her phone. The main thing about this gratitude journal, which is so important is that it is structured. It does have a template, which is very important. And I think that you start out with the day and the date, you know, today can, what's today, Monday, it's July 5th, whatever it might be, and so forth. And then you're going to write down, oh, looks like I lost her. Oh, well, all right. Well, we may, gosh, I may have to wrap this up. I lost a connection with Chrissy Hoover. So let me wrap that up. And I'm going to tell Chrissy, thank you so much for being on the show. And I think a couple of takeaways I have are uh, mind management tips, do something physical, number one, number two, write down a gratitude letter to yourself and the things you're grateful for. And then write down a letter as if you're your best friend, and you are actually commenting on the things that you're doing that are so good. And I think something else that was really important is, is it motivation? And is that emotional? Or are you relying on habits? And if you get really good habits, I think that makes such a really good way to look at things, you can break it down into bite sized pieces and, and the just you know, work away and chip away, make that list and go through that. So, so that's it for this show. Uh, I lost Chrissy, unfortunately. I want to thank Chrissy Hoover so much for being on the podcast. And as a reminder, my podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google and other places where you get podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I so appreciate that. To purchase a gratitude journal or find out more about my gratitude speaking and coaching, you can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And if you'd like to receive my Monday morning minute that goes out every Monday, what a surprise, uh, text uh, the words gratitude guy to 22828. That is gratitude guy 228. There's Christy back again. So, and that's on the Monday morning minute. And if I got you back, is the oh, audio's not on? I think, can you get audio back? I just don't see it there. Anyway, there we go. There we go. I'm just giving them the couple of last minute tidbits here. So let me do this. We're going to wrap up and I lost you there for a little bit. I was telling people a little about the gratitude journal. So Mm -hmm. I have as sort of Chrissy's mind management tips. I like that. 
uh, do something physical. You talked about the weightlifting. Uh, write a gratitude letter or a letter to yourself with all those good things. Uh, I the, the term that I use for that is I call it a what I've got going on list. And I write down all the good things I've got going on right now. It's physically, mentally. That. Yeah. And financially, I mean, friends moved into my new condo. My sons are doing great, whatever it might be. And then write a letter as if you're the best friend commenting on you. Any other mind management tips, Chrissy, to go with those three? Yeah, the only other thing that I would say um, to add to that is to like learn something new. Um, so mm. think of something else like, um, you know, something new that you could research, maybe read a new article that interests you, but learn something new because part of getting your mind unstuck is to give it new information. That's, that's a great point. I really, really like that. Yeah, that's a, and it can be anything. It could be a new skill, a new hobby, a new, any type of thing. Uh, I think even reading new books and, and educating yourself with other podcasts and, and audible books and so forth is so helpful to keep exercising the brain. We forget about the brain is like a muscle as well. So, uh, and lastly, I always end my interviews, Miss Hoover with this question. And that is, and you only get to pick one thing. Okay. At, at your age today, what do you know today that you would like to have known at 18 that you can only pick one thing and it would have helped you a lot if you knew this today that you know we would know that back at 18? Only one thing. Yeah, I know there's a few, but you only get to pick oh one. Oh my gosh. I would say basically the quote that like life is only about 10% what happens to you and about 90% how you react to it mm. and to learn to be less reactive to things and more responsive, which essentially means just taking time to kind of break it down rather than have just an emotional reaction to events or things. Because when you're 18 years old, everything seems so big and so detrimental and so life-changing and really being able to knock things down to the size that they are uh, helps you deal with them. That's a great point. And I like Life is about 10% what happens to you and 90% how you handle it. I've always enjoyed the, co the quote or words to the effect of uh, it's about the biggest part is the action, but the more important thing is your reaction to the action. That's what's really important. And we can decide. I think one of the things I try to really almost hammer on people is every day we have a choice. We have a choice to get out of the bed, the bed on the left side or the right side, be positive, negative, up, down, grateful, ungrateful, whatever it might be. It's a choice. And people will occasionally start the sentence with, you don't understand. And I just thought, no, 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 don't, don't go any further with that line, please. Because I know an excuse is coming up here. So, right. Anyway, so. Yeah, I would say that. And then also like, instead of reacting to respond, because I think reacting is like your first, you know, gut feeling or whatever, but responding right. is like, okay, this is the scenario. This is logically what's going on. You know, this is me and my capabilities and how I can handle it. And this is how I'm going to respond. Exactly. So Exactly. And it kind of, for some reason, it, it comes to mind this, I hear it on the advertisement from the hardware store or something, measure twice and cut once or something. It's something like <laughs> yeah. spend a little more time thinking about it before you just go out and cut or what have you. So anyway, well, thank you, Chrissy, so much for being on the show. Thank I appreciate you. it. You bet. And just as, again, kind of a little reminder, I like that last one. Do something physical, write a gratitude letter, write a letter to yourself as a best friend and learn, and something, learn new. something new. Learn something new. So important. Some great tips from Chrissy. And so uh, also a couple last things. As I mentioned, if you'd like to get the Monday Morning Minute, you can text to 22828 is the number, five digits, 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, you'll get the Monday Morning Minute. Also, as an exclusive to my podcast listeners, I'm offering my six-month proprietary gratitude coaching program that can transform your life for the three-month price. Just email me and let me know you heard about it on the podcast. Finally, thanks so much for tuning in. And until next time, I'm David George Brook, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.